possibly dull question in some ways. It's <laughs> been niggling me. Um, Miranda, in your talk, you said that that um, once you've got a diagnosis of allergy, then that saves money. But you've made a distinction between perceived allergies and, and real allergies. So presumably, you can only diagnose the symptoms. <coughs> so what what happens to the perceived ones? So I guess they just carry on costing money indefinitely. Um, well, there are GPs here, and I understand that um, people who are convinced they have a food allergy may be um, slightly heart sink in the sense that they'll return often with the conviction that they should be, you know, investigated further. Um, in this in this study, we we had different levels. We had personal diagnosis, self diagnosis. Um, we had people with clear symptoms that suggested that they might be actually allergic to specific foods. Uh, we had people who had been had a serum test. Now the serum tests are a debate even amongst biochemists and, and food allergists as to what, how, what they mean. Um, so that the, the, the sort of gold standard, and even that I'm not sure about, is this double blind food challenge test which is quite an expensive thing to do, and it, it's quite scary too, because it could induce a anaphylaxis. Um, and so people go into this willingly. Um, so in the whole of the European, all the collaborating centres, there were relatively few people who actually were screened through the processes of diagnosis and who also went into the double blind. And the two, the ones, the ones we were looking at were the ones who had positive serum test for food allergy and then were followed up and during the subsequent period we looked at um, six months later they're filling in the questionnaire again. So it was just a comparison of people who um, had been diagnosed versus um, the control group were people who had um, been in the same clinic but not with food allergy. Um, and they use the health system less after diagnosis. So this is mainly in Poland and um, Spain, two big centres in the world. So if your diagnosis was you have a perceived allergy, then you still use the health system less. Is that a diagnosis? No, the perceived <laughs> no, the, the perceived allergy, the ones with who we were not clinically diagnosed with allergy. I, I don't um. Oh, right, okay, I got it. Yeah. So, the ones with real allergies use the health service. Yes, I mean, like afterwards, but you just don't know with the others. I think I need to reread re -read all our papers <laughs> <laughs> to be clear. But the point is that the, the diagnosis process seems to be associated with changes in the use of the services. Um, and it's partly to do with personal education and understanding of their condition and their knowledge of um, what they have to do. Um, I think you find that a classic as a GP would be chronic fatigue syndrome, where often they will use surface loads and loads and come in with lots of disparate symptoms. And actually, when you actually give them the diagnosis, it can be actually very useful um, and advice. I mean, it's, it's depressing in a way because it's very clear you can offer in the way of management of advice. But I think just giving them the diagnosis often means that they certainly, the GP, don't come and see me as much because they, it's really down to self management. Mm -hmm. So, so that would be another thing where the cost. itself can have a placebo effect? I think it. I think it's more that if they get say more muscle aches and more headaches, they now have a reason why they're getting that and so they don't have to come in and ask for more diagnostic tests because the big thing with making the diagnosis is saying you do not need any more investigative tests, we've done them all and that's it. And does that doesn't, make sense? Doesn't, doesn't that link to what Robbie's been talking about, the anxiety of not knowing <coughs> what the next step is? Is it something similar to that where we've ruled out the terrible stuff 
by having a diagnosis, even if it's perhaps a wastebasket diagnosis. I, I don't know if it's fair. I think it's a very positive diagnosis myself, but then I disagree with most of the most morbid questions. Did you, I'm sorry, I missed the adjective you used? I, I think it's a very, it, it, it is a, can be a very useful diagnosis. Useful diagnosis. I think it's a really real one. Yes. But it's given to it's given to too many people who given depression. A, a, a bit cavalierly. But, but having some sort of cognitive mastery over what this <coughs> state means, um, does that reduce some of the the, uh, the risk, expectation, anxiety? My love, like the like in the the little clip that you showed us. Yeah. Just front of diagnosis in front of fatigue syndrome is so contested yes. that it can yeah. be a relief, a source of stigma, mm. all sorts of things. You know, yeah. it, it sort of depends probably on. The, Person in the, the, the culture, the culture that they're in. There was a wake up call that no, I no, no doctor's giving me something, I'll get on and make a plan for the rest yeah, of my life. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, another way of thinking about it is instead of just alignment, you could argue it's a kind of form of colonization, couldn't you? I mean, I know it's all very well talking about diagnosis, a kind of therapeutic event in and of itself, but you could also see it's just a way in which actually the patient becomes completely incomplete encompassed in a biomedical framework. There is therefore no room for resistance. So even if it doesn't make economic sense, perhaps people falling outside of diagnostic category is precisely what you want. <coughs> there isn't a much of a mass movement for the undiagnosed. No, I agree. And I think, <laughs> I think that's sometimes it's worrying. I mean, perhaps we should generalize it. But sometimes, you know, in the work I've done, I kind of hope, want people to resist. In principle, yeah. some people should resist in order yeah. to have some resistance in the The trouble is that research tends to start with people who are in the health system. And, and I mean, my husband doesn't like being in the health system. And he was um, had a follow-up appointment <coughs> that he's replaced with. And he said at breakfast, oh, I don't think I'll go. And I said, oh, probably better now, today's the day to cancel. Uh, and it went, and it was all very efficient, and it's fine, and it's good. And they said, we're not going to do any more follow-ups, normally we would. And of course, he was delighted. <laughs> he said, no, I'm very glad they're not going to. You know, they, they said, just bring us if anything goes wrong. But um, there are a lot of people who don't want to be in it. I, I agree with that. I think there's a massive assumption that people want to start There might not be a mass yeah. social movement at the end of the day, but I think very small amount of research, but I know people have as well, and people have an experience. <coughs> One thing they all said was <coughs> they were tired of other people trying to find solutions and so on, and they were quite happy because one of them said, <coughs> should be, I should be here, I'm not going to have it from the table. Um, they, they weren't looking for diagnosis, everybody assumed they were looking for diagnosis. Doctors assumed the patient wants a diagnosis. What they want is someone to say, Acknowledge their symptoms and maybe have <coughs> go with managing their symptoms, which is increasingly difficult in an evidence based world because there's no evidence based evidence for treatment for something that actually works for that person. But there's no. Yeah. I mean, just to qualify, I said uh, there's no mass movement from the undiagnosed among people seeking medical care. Yeah, my first no, of, then, even yeah. among that, you're right. I mean, I, in, uh, I stopped seeing patients five or six years ago, but uh, with a certain. and I. So I wrote something about chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic Lyme disease. Historically, I actually attracted quite a few patients mm -hmm. who were coming in. And for some people, uh, once um, fear diseases were ruled out, and yeah. I could almost present them with a choice. We could label your medically unexplained symptoms mm -hmm. X mm -hmm. or Y. And on the positive ledger, you might get involved in a research trial or get your mm -hmm. Sadie off your back. <laughs> You know, or, or whatever. But on the other hand, you might not, and you know, we can just manage things. And for a certain number of people, it's a very liberating diagnosis, mm -hmm. a liberating conversation, conversation. Mm -hmm. you know, to have to empower yeah, people. No, but a lot of people yeah. feel it's yeah. like yeah. talking yeah. Greek to someone who doesn't speak Greek, you yeah. know. Because there's a massive assumption that if you've got a diagnosis, you're going to feel better. And it, it's not necessarily the case. And I remember going to a medical sociology conference years ago, and father my own job, and this woman was. How these patients weren't happy with this label because they would rather not have a label than something that was a symbol. That was a long while ago, fibromyalgia is something slightly different. Well, I think some of the, the arguments about 
and not needing a diagnosis depend on the quality of your healthcare provider. Absolutely. If, if you're stuck in a system that actually refuses to treat you unless they have a diagnosis, then you're, you're really disadvantaged on many fronts. And I think there is actually a bit of a, uh, a coming together of some patients who've got, I can't remember what the medical terminology is, but you can have basically secondary cancers where they never manage to find out where the original tumour is. Um, and that's a really weird position to be in because although you're clearly ill, the health service, of, certainly according to <coughs> what I've read in this country, just cannot work out what to do with you. You can't work out where to fit you in. You can be diagnosed as having these secondary cancers, but because you've got no primary diagnosis, um, well, three questions in the audience. I'm very aware that I'm, I was writing the notes and not looking up. So who was first? Was it first of Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm noticing when we're talking about diagnosis and giving diagnosis, but I'm we're beginning to stray into a territory of of what do the people given the diagnosis do with the diagnosis when they're when they're given it, and you know the diagnosis carries a kind of script with it as to what the appropriate life behaviours are. But people may or may not do those things with it, so they may reject it. You know, no, not happy with that one, go and find another doctor, keep going until I find one I like. You know, which is a story that we sometimes hear. They may see the diagnosis as actually a really important way of organising and coordinating and managing their own care. So it's a stick with which to go around and beat other parts of the system with. You know, it becomes an important part of the way in which they manage the healthcare environment around them. They may figure it into a set of stories about their life and their, you know, its meaning and its, you know, they may use it psychologically in all kinds of ways. They may use it within their family, within their, their work context to manage, you know, how they deal with their employer. <coughs> how they, and I'm just, I'm sort of thinking that we're talking in this kind of anecdotal way all the way about, about this without really having a sense of, of the range of possibilities of how diagnosis gets taken up and used by, by individuals, that, 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 that there's a really rich field there. Well, I, I, I think just here today we're talking perhaps <coughs> anecdotally, but, mm. but I think um, actually there's a, there's there a, a heap of, yeah, there's a heap mm. of research which, which yeah. looks at that and tries to understand that. And I think the better understanding we have of the myriad ways that mm. people take diagnosis and use it, um, we also have tools w which help clinicians to deliver those, which help us support people who receive diagnoses and help us to understand, I think, the impact of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, yes, we've been anecdotal, um, but there's a lot of research out there as yeah. well. I, 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 I sort of have a feeling that we weren't really delving into that enough. We talked, you yes. talked about it in particular at the beginning about sense making and the way in which diagnosis yeah. works. Yeah, yeah. Definition of systematic well, review. Well, well, no, I, I, I think we're not actually. But, but, um, yeah. but, but I, I think, it, I mean, the, but the point is, we also have heaps, heaps and heaps of different variables, and we have different kinds of diagnoses. We have diagnoses which are linked to particular stigmas, or diagnoses which are linked to particular administrative uh, imperatives, or, or legal ones or the ability to uh, discontinue treatment. So um, in each context, we're going to have a different set of, well, many sets. And we could never, if we're looking at gout as one simple example, we can certainly look at gout in a Polynesian population, but then we should probably look at our Tokalaman separate from our Tongan separate from our, um, our Maori. So that, and, and then you have to look at Joe as separate or, or from you know, someone else, yeah. so that, in fact, what, what happens with diagnosis, I think, as diagnosis is a classification device, it's trying to find the general, or it's trying, it, it's trying to generalize, it is about generalization, in fact, because um, we actually perhaps wouldn't need, um, well, diagnosis is about assembling groups of symptoms and, 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 and saying these things are more like this than they are like that, right? So why it is that we differentiate? Well, we, we're looking for the general single cases, being able to put them in a general category and say, well, if this is gout, um, and, and we will count that as a gout case, and we will take such and such appro approach with gout case because we can test it as a as a thing. We give it its ontological existence, and I think um, that that whole issue of diagnosis is that it is in many ways obfuscating the individual. It's obfuscating the individual case, right? It's grouping things together. But by the same token, we can never know 
all of the different ways and we can attempt to capture them by a variety of methods and certainly um, there, there's a lot of, of research which uh, um, um, Sarah can talk about medically and explain symptoms and her particular group in Great Britain at a given time with a given set of symptoms, but we'll never capture the, the whole thing. Um, and so, yes, there's research out there, and we've given anecdotes to tell stories because that's a helpful way to understand it, but, but, but to think that it's only anecdotal, I think, would, would be incorrect. Is that, um, I mean, yeah, I I'm, I'm, sure it, I'm, I'm sure it exists. It's, it's the way in which we've been talking about it, which yeah. is that we keep coming back to our concerns. Yes. Uh, uh, but actually, uh, sorry, but I, I think you make a good point, but the other thing that I'd like to build on your point <coughs> is that we are all telling stories, um, which is exactly what our patient is going to do. It's exactly what the clinician is going to do, and it's exactly what we're doing as researchers, because it gives us a narrative and a sense of, of what's important in the things that we're facing and discussing. But, but I'm not trying to say anything's wrong in what you said. No, uh, yeah, I think those are very good points. And, and, uh, yeah. okay. I have empirical data <laughs> uh, with family members of people who are in vegetative or minimally conscious states. And with Sarah Nettleton, we're looking at the role that talk about diagnosis plays, <coughs> um, and particularly the diagnosis ba boundary between vegetative and minimally conscious since if you're vegetative, the court is likely to approve the draw of treatment and if you're minimally conscious, it's very unlikely to. So I actually had a question which was about the economics of this. Um, it's a two-part question. The first part of the question is, I hear families talking, doing lay economic theorizing about their loved ones, saying, for example, it is crazy to keep this person alive at the cost of and they have some, it's all paid for by the National Health Service, but they know how much it costs when my sister can't get a cataract operation or when X can't get knee surgery done. So there's a lay economic theorizing out there amongst ordinary people. So my first question is, has anybody analyzed that? Is there work on that? And my second question is, do you know of any research um, either in this country, the US, or any place else that's looking at um, using the kind of economic modeling that you've been talking about that is looking at the economic costs and benefits of maintaining people in vegetative and minimally conscious states? Firstly, um, I mean, it's, an, it's actually, the, the economists would say it's an ethical question and that uh, the economics is determined by the law in the sense that clinicians can only do what's allowed. That's certainly true, but in terms of so if you were on a working party for the Royal College of yes. Physicians trying to figure out what should we make, what sh how should we advise the board to change, you would surely want an economic view on this. Yes, Alan, so Alan Williams, who was the, uh, one of the founding fathers of British Health Economics, um, he wrote a paper called Fair, Inni a Fair Innings, yes. which was about exactly that issue. Okay. And I can't remember where it was published. But if you look up Alan Williams, and he wrote a lot of it, it was debated a lot within health economics groups. It's, and it was an equity, it, it was the question that I said about health it's economic evaluation just says a quality is a quality is a quality, mm -hmm. you know, whatever age people are at, and so on. And there's been a group um, who have subsequently, for sponsored by NICE, researched the question of should qualities be different at different ages and different stages of ability? And it was based on population work on quality of life of people with different conditions and different stages. And my colleague here, Angela Robinson, who's a senior lecturer in Rio Verna um, Health Economics, was one of the collaborators on that project. And it was with Ken Dawes and Glasgow. Um, and They, 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 I think they published in Grey Blooms, who's now in Warwick. Um, so, so if I email you, it might be something. Yes, that might be the best thing. Yes. yes, and there's also been quite a huge body of work on the costs of dying and the lengths of treatment and the appropriate end of life decisions. Um, just a couple of thoughts. One, one um, when you foreground diagnosis, which is why we're here, um, I suppose what we can see is that how important it seems to be at some junctures. Um, but also, I suppose, well, my wife runs a chronic fatigue network. She actually had chronic fatigue. And she actually had a diagnosis. 
Mostly because the locals tested everything, and she, she found that she had the Epstein Barr virus, which is one way, one route to chronic fatigue, as I understand it. And when she, and she had the chronic fatigue, and then she started running the chronic fatigue network. And very soon into doing that, she said, actually, this should just be a fatigue network. So actually, it's delivering to, it's responding to a set of symptoms. Because loads of people have fatigue, you know. So how do we do that? So in a sense, then, it would go to what you were saying there about sort of diagnostic, diagnosis not really mattering as such, but actually the NHS configuring itself to support supporting people through a series of things. Some who, some of whom may get better because what they've had is a liver transplant and they're tired for a year, and some who may never get better. In that, in that sense, but they, they're dealing with it within the boundaries of their own way. And that seems to me a much more useful thing to do than just get that diagnosis of chronic fatigue and have that negotiation about, because as my wife said, for people who are meant to be very tired, you know, chronic fatigue patients get, and ME patients get very angry and they seem to expend a lot of energy being angry. <laughs> so you know, the interesting irony there. Um, <laughs> but and I suppose the second thing is that what I've heard noticed a lot today, people talking about implicitly and explicitly about technology and the way that diagnosis is used to push the, the boundaries of medicine, biomedicine into spaces where it maybe even shouldn't be. Because what it's doing is creating a conveyor belt of pre pre diagnosis where, where we're all on it. You know, so it's what you were saying this morning, Robert, really about, you know, the pre 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 testing where you may probably have cancer at some point in the future. And what we're going to do is get you on that conveyor belt now so we can medicalise you. And who's that benefiting? It's certainly not benefiting the people on the end of that. It seems to be benefiting um, professionals' careers and it's and, and the R&D environment and drug companies and, and people who want to sell this stuff. So it is, it's, it's this sort of illusion, I think we were talking about earlier, about the technology being the solution. And uh, it's not at all, actually. It seems to be a perversely a part of the problem because we're not even doing the stuff we we know we're good at that well. Never mind any trying to invent new things that are wrong with us, it seems to me. <laughs> so the diagnosis is actually being used in that way to sort of create those boundaries, to, to, to create that sort of situation. It was, like, you know, it had a sort of, it was almost Fordist, what you were saying this morning. Yeah. You know, let's assemble cancer patients as a, as a, a, on a sort of, on a sort of line. Yeah. So there's a lot in there, but I just thought I'd do to share. So. So everyone's left now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd just like to ask, ask if there's any kind of, you know, there's lots of consumer movements around people who self-help groups that people with conditions with diagnosis. Well, that, well that's, that's, that's about their identity, yeah, yeah. In maternity, in maternity, for example, there, there's, a, there's consumer groups about being healthy. Oh, yeah, quite, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, are there consumer groups about being healthy without any other conditions? <laughs> 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 it's a good right thing, like, if you're expecting a baby, you've got a, a thing to work towards. I've got a thing in my hand, yeah. yeah. I suppose that's what NCT is. Yes. Uh, yes. National Child Care Trust. Yes, it's not just about directing you to the health system. In fact, I saw somebody around the t-shirt with jeans. Oh, I, think, <laughs> I, think what, I think what I'm saying is the health system seems to respond to uh, illness, not health. Not health. I mean, that, that, yeah. that's the bias. I mean, yeah, and that's probably not appropriate. I suppose sports enthusiasts do a lot of health stuff. Yeah. 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 Yeah, big users of the energy. Sure, my wife runs a directory in Newcastle for new mums called Get Your Tots Out. So, you know, that's a wellness being, enjoying being a mum thing. So, you know. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to say something about the, the suggestion that technology actually is, is part of the problem. I, mean, I don't know if you're familiar with Daniel Callahan, the bioethicist in the States that has written a lot about this, what he calls the, the ragged frontier, because he basically he says the more technology advances, the more we give ourselves to do. Um, so it's not a battle we are ever going to win. And once you conceptualise it like that, you, you arrive at the question, well, sh should we stop and if so, where? Which is a question I I can't find very many people with an appetite to, to really seriously address, but I think it does need to be addressed. And the other thing I think that's interesting, interesting about Callahan's work is the degree to which it's common sense that new technologies do create new needs. 
So instead of reducing the sum of need, Quack. we are increasing it. Not just new needs, I'd say it's also new work. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. we're being configured to do more work on our health, or well, actually our illness. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think there's a lot in what you're saying, especially, I don't know if you like the quantified self movement, you know, the idea of constantly wearing devices all the time to monitor all your bio yes. functions and report you. But I don't think it's being driven by the health service, it's very much more commercial technologies and the ideology of managing your health, you're so taking responsibility for your own health, you buy products and monitor yourself send the data to a commercial company. It was the same thing with 23 and me, take responsibility for your genetic health, get back in tech, you know, get give them your saliva and get back this piece of information that won't actually be very useful 99% of the time. Quite. Yeah. Um, but that's I don't see that as being something not being driven by our health service. I think that's very much more But I would ask who's the who are the shareholders? Those companies, and I suspect some of them are doctors who are working in universities. I, I, I mean, I, I can't, I can't verify that, but I, I have a strong sense, looking at what's going on in these sorts of spaces, that that's, that, and the universities themselves are investing in that sort of stuff. They, they may well be, but that's you know, there's a long, there's, you know, that's going back to to be like companies, and yeah, yeah, right. know, and all that stuff about that's that's make sure that you know, that's make sure that every invention turns into innovation and makes more money. This yeah. is. Sure, sure, but more broadly. But yeah, yeah. I, I mean, my wife's part of that as well. She set up a thing called Handy to help people build health apps. <laughs> so, you know. Well, there's, there's, there's a divergence because there is a sort of you know, biohackers and people like that, and people writing their own apps to do it to, you know, open data. Sure. Are you taking away the data from medical authority? But the idea that the algorithms, the solutions to these problems is, is a, an illusion, you mm. know, actually. You know, it's actually what I hear, is the, and I've heard today, and I, what I perceive from my own research, is it's actually the relations that actually improve people's health. What the technology does is, it, is increase people's illness. I mean, it's a bit of black and white, but that's what it looks like to me. <laughs> okay. I think it's I think a bit too black and white, because I think... I, I think the problem again is that that's anecdotal and, and, and that I think we need much, much more critical evaluation without this assumption that new technology is new, that, that, that it needs to be very, very critically evaluated. But we, I, I, I think it's an, it, it, it becomes a neutral argument if it all goes down to a reduction that we don't want new technology. Because certainly people out there aren't going to sign up for that. If, if a piece of new technology comes along that tells you which kids have meningitis, you know, and I mean, you know there are certain diagnoses that would still benefit from uh, you know highly sophisticated, better delivered technology. I think what well, you're talking about today yeah. is how it is used in a very or still very traditional model of diagnosis where at the start of the, the, the debate to this evening, that, and, and your a nice example around, around fatigue, it, it, it is that essentially still doctors too much are regarded as having failed if they don't make a diagnosis, whereas actually there's a whole pile of symptoms and, and problems that we can deal much more efficiently with leaving the diagnostic model to one side and simply asking for good evidence of what the best, most patient-centered approach to these problems are, and not assuming again that diagnosis has the answer to it. No, I agree. I think, I, I mean, I was, I, was, I was sort of sending it up a bit, I would say, but, is, but I still go back to the relational aspects of this. I, th I think that's where the, where the value is. Can I the conversation. Awareness of time, and I did want to finish a quarter two. I've got one question from Sarah, <laughs> so I'm really desperate to respond. Oh, so can we say that's what we'll... I might have changed my mind about the response because I may have misunderstood what you were saying as you talked further. I may have changed my mind that I needed to say this, but one of the things I did want to say is that there is a place for diagnosis. There's a place for technology. Um, medicalization is not about bad doctors sitting around in a room deciding how they're going to capture people and 
put them into some nasty box which isn't going to work for them. And I think, though, that doesn't remove the responsibility of the sociologist to continue to explore what the limitations of diagnosis, technology, and medicalization are, as well as to identify <coughs> where the sources of, of contest, of power, of abuse may, may reside. But in the end, that wasn't really what you were saying anyway. So that was just a random thought that I threw out there that you uh, in, um, encouraged me to make. But um, Can we end on? Well, I have a question that's probably impossible to answer. Well, well let's end on it then. It's been troubling me all day. It's kind of directed at Robbie, I think, but perhaps other people as well. I mean, I think your talk was terrific, and you know, as you know, sort of a lot of your work anyway, that notion of risk as a kind of experience, as a, uh, as a diagnosis. And you kind of focused, I mean, I know there's limits of time, but I talk around yep. the issue of fear. It looks like in your discussion, you also talked about how um, I think perhaps some of these things are driven by technologies, but I think they're also um, doctors and what have you. But, I think it's also the fact that it's congruent neoliberalism and that sort of broader canvas about personal responsibility and all that stuff we've just been talking about, you know, collecting data for ourselves. And there is a literature on notions of obligation. There's quite some nice stuff I've done by people like Nina Hamilton and Alex Housen and others that shows particularly women feel that they have to go and have tests and then take action and so on. So all that kind of feeds into my question that it's highly problematic having this, you know, it's not necessarily good for our health having this generating this anxiety. And yet there's an assumption that you talked about that it's good, this early detection. And just this week, probably quite a few people, Jane's come up and she forwarded it to the MedStop group, a call from the health service to for researchers like us to help try and fine-tune the population to seek diagnosis early. The focus of the call, research call is early oh, diagnosis. Right. So my question is, because I know you engage with policy people, yeah. how do we intervene in that? Because when I saw that, I just wanted to think, the question is not to how, how to get people to go and seek diagnosis early, but to prioritize <coughs> it. I'll tell you one, just one small part of the impossible question to answer, <laughs> which is, I, I do think um, someone earlier this, in the day mentioned social determinants of health. But I think one answer to some of the push for this mindset of early diagnosis and risk, especially if, you know, if the health problem has known social determinants of some sort, is to sort of re sometimes refocus your, the effort, that same kind of zeal and effort. I mean, one thing that worries me is, I mean, it was, it was meant, I think it was a BMJ article, it was meant as a joke about uh, polypill, yeah. you know, which inverts the sort of population health mentality and mm -hmm. says, you know, let's, you know, treat everyone for everything mm -hmm. uh, in a way with a little bit of something or whatever. whatever. And so, uh, you know, I think rebalancing, it's, it's just one small part of this, mm -hmm. this, this question. You know, I don't, I don't have any answers, any, hardly any mm -hmm. answers. But I think getting the medical, often people who push social determinants of health think of all health care as the enemy. In some sense, all those non-healthcare determinants, that, and, and healthcare has consumed so much of the budget in a way. But I think they're sometimes alienating a lot of physicians and the people who know very well that the problems that they're seeing have proximal or distal causes of the neurodegenerative so, you know, way beyond the, the, and, and, and want to be aligned with them at some level. It, it's another way of saying you need a positive message, not just a negative one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes to, to influence policy makers or whatever. That's that, in many in many of the situations where early detection is being pushed. You, you could, and of course, often. Well, there's an economic evaluation. Yeah. Because of course, it's yeah. Certainly, yeah. 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 I mean, well, often we don't know what the social determinants yeah. are really. Yeah. That's the problem. And I think yeah. there's lots more research, and it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, but just because it's complicated doesn't mean we should invest. I must have a look at the research call because yeah. it's obviously is it predicated on that the health service could run more efficiently? Well, they could use you, they could be more effective because I suppose it's the assumption that was in Robbie's talk that if you get identified, if you've got your chance to identify, you just increase the denominator. So the yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So maybe it's a place to serve overall. Yeah. Because yeah. there are more people to treat. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. they need somebody to put that in the BMJ. Yeah. But I mean, the tour and the deadline quite soon, and you know, when I saw it, I thought, God, how depressing. And then when I 